kind of happy about them. You know, smaller groups and people want to work. But I want to start with a little pre-drill. So if you could take out a sheet of paper, that would be great. And the first thing, you're going to do a couple of terms in the skull, a couple of the more difficult ones. So the first one that I want you to tell me, so now we'll go right into the nitty gritty detail. So I'm opening up the skull, and as I look down, this is the front, this is the back. By the foramen magnum, which is this big hole here, on the side I got these two ridges, these two ridges on the side of the foramen magnum. I want to have you tell me what are these ridges called. It's where we have the um, hearing apparatus in there. What are these ridges called? That number one. And then number two, we're going right um, towards the midline of both of these ridges, and there is a little thing where the pituitary gland sits in. A little indentation, kind of a fossil thing. What is that called? It's an interesting name. That thing here where the pituitary gland sits in. There we go. That's number two. And so when I, again, I reiterate, the, say the same thing many times. When I do the test, I either ask for bones, for landmarks, or for muscles. These are landmarks, what we just did. The next one, number three, I want you to tell me a bone. And I want you to tell me the cheekbone. What is the cheekbone called? What is the cheekbone called? Good. Then, we have another bone, number four. That's the bottom of the spine here, that bone. What is that whole bone called? That's number four, that whole bone. Then the next one, number five, that is, I want you to tell me on the rib, we have a few bumps as the rib comes around, goes into the body like that. In the back here, we have one bump that touches the body of the vertebra, and then a little uh, narrower area, and then we have another bump that touches the transverse process of a vertebra. What is that bump called? In the head, facial muscles, I want you to tell me as number six, the deep one on the side of the cheek, the deep one that's really powerful in babies for suckling. It's attached to the corner of the mouth and goes deep. What is that one called? That's number six. And then number seven, we have a muscle from the corner of the mouth that goes up to the cheekbone that we just talked about. The muscle from the corner of the mouth up to the cheekbone and helps us in smiling. What is that muscle called? On the arm, on top of the humerus, we got a couple of bumps. And these are the bumps that then the muscles in the back and the front of the shoulder blade attach to and hold that arm, that arm in, that humerus in. What is the bigger one of those bumps called? Now I lost the count. Number seven is that or number eight? Eight. Eight. That was number eight. And then number nine. If I go down on the shaft of the humerus on the outside, I got a little roughage, a little area where we have a muscle going. It's going to be the muscle coming from here going and holding it in like that. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But what's that roughage called? That's number nine. What's that little area of your called? As I then go distally towards the elbow, we orient ourselves. The head is here. The head points medially. On the inside, we got this bump. It's right here. If you bang it, it hurts. Skin is right over it. What is that bump called? It's a landmark. It's where the funny bone is, too. That's behind here, the nerve goes through, and if you hit it, it kicks you, shoots down the finger. So that was 10. Oh, good. Okay, good. No. And then we go to the forearm moss bones. So now we're already left, right? Um, we have. Two forearm muscles. We got one that goes to the thumb, and one that goes to the pinky. 
and this is where we have a palm forward. That's the anatomical position. On the one that goes to the thumb, we have a bump here. What is that bump called? Look at all these bumps. A landmark. There's a landmark. What is this landmark called? And then the last one. Where we're going to do that will be number twelve. Is the on the other most a bone that goes to the pinky? What's the tip? up there called the tip of the elbow. If you do this, it, you're touching this part. What is that called? All right, so let's solve it. Let's go backwards. What was number 11? 12? Yeah, you guys better just say that. What was that called? Electron on process. Speak it out loud. The more we repeat, the easier it gets. What is this bump called here? Radial tuberosity, very good. Then we got this bump here. Medial epicondyle, very good. And then what about the roughage up here? Deltoid tuberosity. And I think then we went to the big bump. What was the big bump called? Greater tubercle. Good. The one, well, the smiling muscle, what's that called? Zygomaticus. And what about the deep one on the side? The buccinator. Buccinator, buccinator. That's the nice thing about anatomy. You can kind of say it the way you want because the whole world uses the same term. And they all speak it differently. That, that's the dimple. That's the dimple one, yeah, correct. The bump on the rib, what was that called? The rib tubercle, yeah. Uh, or tubercle of the rib. And then the bone? Sacrum. Cheekbone, zygomatic bone, and then we did the indentation here where the pituitary gland sits in, cella torsica, and the ridges, petrous portion. Petrous portion. The cribriform plate is in the front, where the little holes are supposed to be, that the olfactory nerves come up from the nose, the smelling nerves, and they go up into those little holes and attach to the brain up here. So that's the creep reform place. So when I look at the um, upper extremity muscles, um, I group them together. So the first group I do, so here you see this, this is the superficial trapezius. We talked about that last time. Now we're talking about muscles that, the first group I want to talk about is muscles that the anchor the shoulder blade into the trunk. And on this side, obviously, the trapezius is removed. You have one here, too, which is removed. So we can see the underneath muscles. So we got muscles back here that attach to the medial border or the vertebral border of the scapula. They go inward and hold the shoulder blade in this way. And then they also go up into the neck and they hold the shoulder blade into the neck. So from the back, we got a few muscles. This one is the same as this, it's just a smaller version. So the rhomboid has a minor and a major. You see a muscle has a major, um, that means the major one. But you see a minor, that's usually the smaller one. So you see, if you say major, you assume there's a minor somewhere. Otherwise, you don't have to say that. So that's um, how that sort of terminology goes. And then we also have muscles that anchor the shoulder blade in, sort of hold it into the chest from the front from all the way in here and they anchor it into the chest this way they hold it against the chest wall and then the last so that's from the sort of underside and the last muscle that holds the shoulder blade in is one in the front that pulls it downward into the ribs if we look here at that one that's attached here which is shoulder blade goes inward that way so that gives us some solid connections from the shoulder blade into the trunk and anchoring the upper extremities to the, to the chest wall. Um, and then from there, we have a group of muscles that are going to hold the arm into the shoulder blade. Those are those rotator cuff muscles. And then after that, we start moving the arm around. So the arm, ooh, this is not the arm. The arm muscles are, are attached here and here to move the arm around because they're going to pull on the chest wall as well. But those are movers. And then after the, the arm movement, we're going to have elbow movement and those muscles are attached on the upper arm and then the wrist moves are the last one we're going to talk about we don't usually go into the fingers in this session 
uh, but those muscles are the four. So the muscles that move the joint are usually proximally more towards the attachment of that joint, not the other way around. More, more. We're gonna screw that in later with my Swiss army now. All right, so that's the overview. So let's go to the details. So the first muscle I wanna talk about on that list is the serratus anterior. Let's see where so I'm the serratus anterior, as I said already, is the shoulder blade on the vertebral border on the underside. So it's here on the underside. So they flip that shoulder blade backwards to make the visual. And then these muscles go nicely onto the ribs like that. And, and, and attach the shoulder blade anchoring this way. You can see that here, if somebody does a push-up or just a plank, and you, the shoulder blade's nicely attached to the trunk, that means that muscle is nicely working. Because if that muscle won't be working, the shoulder blade will go and give you a winging scapula look like that. So, so it pulls back. So you couldn't hold the shoulder blade to the trunk. So that's known as the serratus anterior. Uh, from the bird's perspective, serrated comes so when you look at it from the side, when you, when you look at it, it looks a little bit like a serrated knife. And so that's like a bread knife. That's where they got the terminology from. So that's the one on the other side. Then in the in the back, we got a couple players. We got that one that is on top here, anchoring the shoulder blade or lifting it up into the neck. And the name is levator, lifting it up, levator scapula, lifting up the shoulder blade. And that's attached to the a tip up here, the shoulder blade, the scapula medial upper corner or angle, and that goes up to C1 to C4 onto the transverse process here in the neck. And it's holding that shoulder blade off that way into the neck. So that's that. Levator scapula muscle. One of my favorite. That muscle is big. On people, that muscle is underneath the trapezius, so it's harder to get to. But it's really thick, and it really is a lot of times a player that makes people pain, gives people pain. If people have something pulling on their neck or feet, a lot of times it's that muscle that's yanking on it. So that's why even if you've got a pain here, you've got to look at all the stuff too to make sure that the connections are working or, or that, that the system functions from that perspective. In, in my work, I look at what's not quite functioning right and try to make it function better and that's sort of where we sometimes get a little frustrated with medicine when it comes to musculoskeletal things because often they want to cut something out. And that's often not that indicator, unfortunately. All right, anyway, then we have the rhomboids. So we go a little further down. The levator was up here. The rhomboids come from the medial border, go into the spine that way. And they hold the spine that way. You can sort of visualize that. I think, oh, in the booklets you have these. All, the, all muscles have these kind of pictures with the X's on them, and I always fail to talk about. I might as well talk about. So when you have a problem in your rhomboid muscle, it could give you pain patterns here. So the red is what pain that muscle can give you. And the X's stand for if you were a massage person, you are, or with your family, you're good at the hands, you can find pressure points in those areas and squeeze them and then the muscle has to relax because you squeeze all the blood out of it, but it replenishes the muscle with fresh blood, and very often those pains get smaller. So that's why if you do foam roller, tennis ball work, these are great places to start finding points that give you grief. Those are the muscles, oh no, we got one in the front that I cannot forget, right here. We got the pectoralis minor. So the pectoralis, the pec, is a big one on top is the pectoralis major, and that's going to be a muscle that moves the arm around, that does this kind of stuff that we're going to uh, talk about in a minute. But underneath that, we have a peg minor, and that muscle is attached here to the core cord process in the front, going into the ribs, and anchoring the shoulder blade down to the front and holding it that way. So that gives us sort of the three um, areas of stabilization for that shoulder blade. And then from there, now the shoulder blade is anchored. Of course, it moves around a little too, and those muscles help. But a large part of the deep, deep muscles is to anchor stuff and to hold it together and not moving it as much. Okay, it's not black and white, but generally, you visualize if you have the deepest muscle move the arm around like that, how would the superficial muscle? What would that do, right? It sort of makes some sense. Um, but now we're going to the 
rotator cuffs, and those are the shoulder anchoring muscles. But these are all attached to the shoulder blade in the back and in the front, and then anchor into the greater tuple and the lesser tuple called the humerus. So they're all attached here and underneath here and go into these two bones and hold the shoulder blade in like that, the, the arm, the humerus in like that, and, and, and hold it hold it firmly in. So they're always working those muscles. So if you have three of those muscles in the back and one in the front, these are the beginning letters of their names. The first is supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. All of those names you probably already have in your head because we did study the spine of the scapula and we started the supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa, and subscapular fossa. So if you look at these three verbs here, so, um, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and subscapularis, the names are all from these fossa. So the name is already there, you already have that name. Um, the ones in the back, supra and infra, are attached above the spine of the scapula, below the spine of the scapula, and then go into the greater tubule, which is a little bit more to the outside of the greater tubule. We have one more small one, the teres minor, that's sort of a strangler, and that is almost like the infraspinatus, it's just that last sliver that's attached on the shoulder blade here, not over here, that's kind of, or, or the whole infraspinal fossa, but just on the tip here, and goes also into the greater tubule, and we call that the teres minor. But see, that wasn't too hard. That's the, that's the rotator cuff, or the sits muscle. They, they often refer to us as the sits muscle. Okay, then from there, now, we are already almost halfway down. We can go move the arm around. When we look at the arm movers, the first one I got on there is the pectoralis major. So that's all the line. The, the first one here is the minor coming down from up here. Underneath it is the major. Goes from the arm here, which is the intertubercular root between the two bones area, and goes into the sternum, the ribs, and also even the clavicle up here. Such a really broad muscle, and it's forceful. It can pull that, can pull that arm around in this direction. And then I want to go to the latissimus dorsi muscle, because in the front, in the front you got the pec, then in the back, and the pec goes into here. And does this stuff with the arm. Then in the back, you got the muscle coming up and goes into the same place underneath the arm, and then also here in the, in the front. So that's a big muscle in the back. It's kind of, you know, it's further down, not on top, but it's sort of the equivalent of the pack in the back. And so that muscle does all of those motions, all of this bringing down, bring the arm down motion back. And so that's why swimmers have a big muscle, big one of those, because that's the crawling motion. And so you see, look, this is why this guy is so fast. This is his lats there, and look at these guys. The lats is what you can feel here, that's lats, all of that. So, it's a very interesting muscle. We do have a little helper for the latissimus dorsi, and that's known as the teres major. So now we have a minor, we have a major, and that's, that's the minor is attached here going up, this pump, the major is different, it's attached to the further down at the angle, and then goes to the front of the humor. So if you gotta look at it, in a, oh shoot, I didn't even bring the model out yet, let me do the model in a minute. So the ma major is attached here, it goes underneath there, the ma teres major, and the teres minor is attached up here, it just goes to the outside pump. We can see the peg right in here, that's nice for the peg. Uh, we can also see the serrated anterior here on the side as it comes in. You can sort of see as it comes around here. Then on the arm model, we take this one off. We haven't talked about this one yet, but what we can see here nicely are the rotator cones. You have the, the back one here, that's the supraspinatus. You go below, that's the infraspinatus. And then here goes to the outside. And then here, you see that one on the bottom, the last one, that's the teres minor. We talk now about the teres major. That one goes underneath. You see the difference? Where it goes. It's different where it goes. So you want to make sure to differentiate that. And then underneath the scapula, we got the subscapularis. That's underneath here. And that goes throughout here. We can't really see where it is. Well, it goes right in here, actually. And so the deltoid on the on the model is this muscle here. That's the it's sort of like 
oversits the shoulder pump. Like if you have a padded shoulder, it's kind of that muscle that I think of. So you see that it's attaching nicely all around here from the clavicle, that's the clavicle, to the spine of the scapula, and then goes into this deltoid tuberosity on the outside. A really nice muscle, it does a lot of different things. It goes all the way to the spine, the chromium, and then it reaches the front. And it does, it does all those things. I, I'm putting as a main function on adduction, which is bringing you on the outside. But you can see the posterior fiber bring you on back, and the anterior fiber also bring you on forward. I don't find too many injuries in that, but often if you can find here, if it's really stiff, you can find hurt, you can feel it, then probably somewhere here there's a little bit something on. When there is a joint that's not quite working right, the muscles around it often tighten up and spasm. That's why a lot of times you can get a massage, it feels really great, but unless you also work the skeletal a little bit and ease off the joint pressures, then, um, then it's not as long-lasting as if you do both together. Right, it's, it's very interesting. I often have patients that they come, so what is it? The muscle or the bone? What is the problem? Where's my problem? And I always say it's both. And sometimes they would argue with me. It's like, it can't be both. It's not. It's two different systems. It's like, but the movement apparatus works as a whole. We got, so that was the deltoid. And now we got a few more coming up. We got the corocobrachialis on that list. Because the corocoid process goes down into the humerus and helps raise the arm up. The name is coracoid process brachialis, brachialis. Chapter number one, but those body parts are really helpful to refer back to because we're going to have four muscles that have the word brachial in them. And if you see that word, you know it's up here somewhere. And now let's do the elbow movers. So if you look at the elbow joint, I'm looking at flexion and extension, bending and straightening it out. Not that much more up here. The stuff in the forearm is pronation supination. That's the that forearm. So I'm basically going to have muscles in the front and the muscles in the back. That's really where I need to go with that. So we have a look in the front. I got the biceps break the eye. So biceps means belly. So biceps means this muscle has two bellies. The red stuff is the muscle where it contracts. The white stuff is the tendons that then anchor the muscle into the bone. Um, so by means two bellies. Break the eye, look at that. That's the area, the old. That muscle is also cool because it's attached on, up here, on the, actually on the shoulder blade, this one. And then on the radius, it, uh, it, so it jumps two joints, not just one joint. So it does have some function up here, a little helper function, but its main function is flexing the elbow. Um, and then actually this one has another main function, and that you can see that here. And let me show you that on the model. So if you look at here, so the muscle goes down to this part here, the radial tuberosity. That's, uh, the, yeah, that's why I wanted you to um, do that in a quiz. So if I have the palm down like that, that's palm down, that's this, those two cross over, the radius and the ulna. The humor, I mean the biceps brachia goes right underneath, underneath here to this palm, but underneath, and if it pulls, it rotates that back and it brings the palm up. Or it does supination, that's called. So pronation is palm down, supination is palm up. I remember that because I can hold a whole bowl of soup in my hand if it's supinate. Um, on the model, it's the one, it's another one that often these old models, it sort of falls off and comes out. It's this one. Then underneath the biceps brachii, I got the brachialis muscle. See, another one with that word brachial stuff in it. So that makes it makes it easy that way. And the brachialis muscle is, on a model, if you take the biceps away, underneath, that's the brachialis. So you see on the side, that's a pretty thick muscle. So it's a major strength muscle. This one just goes from the lower shaft to the um, ulna, and really only does the flexion of the elbow joint, the very powerful flexion. And then, now we have the elbow in this position, now we gotta bring it back. So we're going to have a muscle back here that does the contraction and straightens it out. And that's going to be your triceps brachialis. That's a very powerful muscle. It's sort of a combination of the brachialis and the biceps. Because tri means three. Three heads, three bellies. No, have three bellies. Well, actually, it can also be a head. Um, and one of them goes to the blade too, like the biceps did. 
but the other ones anchor into the humerus in the back and then into the electronal process, the tip of the elbow, that they pull this big fascia and pull on that, that straightens out the arm. The brachial radialis. That's, see, another one with brachial in there. So you know, again, you gotta look in that position here, the arm, you're not gonna look at the leg for that. This one is a little trickier though, because it's attached at the distal end of the humerus and then goes all the way down to the tip of the radius styloid process and sort of it helps with the flexion but it also does really work with this part of that like flexion like bringing the wrist upward versus from just elbow half is loose so if you do this that's why it's, a, it's called ten, if you have problem it's a tennis elbow so on the model you see you've got muscles in the forearm here and they really mostly attach at the medial epicondyle and, or further down. But for our purposes, at this point, medial epicondyle. And you can see that here. And then we got muscles on the back side, and they attach more or less all at the lateral epicondyle. More or less. But for our purposes, that's a very good order, a common origin. And then on top, we got this one muscle that you can see reaches quite high into the humerus, of distal humerus, but goes all the way down to here. And that is to break the radialis muscle. So that's where it gets a little tricky. So as we get to the forearm muscles now, I, I'm going to sort of point them out in reference to the other muscles. Because you've got so many muscles, which one is which? It's kind of hard to know. So we learn three on the back side and four on the front side. The medial epicondyle here, that bump sticking out, is that common origin for all these forearm muscles that we're now going to talk about. And so when we look at them, so now let's go back to this one. And now it's the other side, okay? So that's now the medial epicondyle, and all these muscles come down like that. We have four. We have one like that, two like that, three goes right down the middle, and then a fourth goes here to the pinky side. So we got one that goes quite across. That's known as the pronator teres, right here. Pronator teres. The big fat one going across. And again, other side of the picture. So we always have to make sure we reference things around properly. So that's the pronator tail. That muscle is actually interesting. That muscle reaches across, goes to the radial side here, and pulls the radius over the ulna as we go palm down, which is pronation. So the word pronator refers to the function, so pronation. The pronator teres is the major pronator. We have one down here too, but we don't worry about studying that. It's a small one. The interesting thing about this muscle is the pronator teres muscle is where the median nerve goes through. Right here. The median nerve goes through it. And if we always go palm down and type in that on the computer, we're always using that muscle. Because we have to go palm down. That's why some keyboards are like that. So we don't stress that muscle too much. Because if that muscle gets irritated, you can squeeze the nerve, it gives you carpal tunnel syndrome. And so in the old days, the problem with carpal tunnel is the pain is down in here. Because the brain thinks of the nerve going to that place at the end. But the nerve has to travel, and if it's pinched anywhere along its pathway, the brain thinks the pain is down here. And so in the older days, the 80s and stuff, People have pain out here. They cut open. There's a, oh, I should talk about that ligament. Hold on, let me talk about that. There's a ligament. That's a good picture for that. That squeezes all this together here. If you look at, if you look at the wrist, you have these bones here, these wrist bones. They're sort of made that they form this shallow depression here. See that? That's known as the carpal tunnel. And so over that, we have a ligament holding all that together. That's known as the flexor retinaculum. We don't need to worry about that. But that goes around, holds all that together. And all these tendons going into the fingers go underneath that thing. And the nerves do too. So surgically, what they do, if there's pain in here, they think, well, we do too much typing, too much using, too much friction. And that could be the case. But we cut that off. Make a move. Bridge. Again, once we cut it, we cut it. We can't uncut it. So we have to be a little thinking about that because if the diagnostics are not that great, this is not going to help. 
And so that's when they started figuring out to squeeze also here at the pronator, and then up here we can have another squeezing area uh, by the scaling as well. And that can all contribute. And now, you know, nowadays they do a nerve conduction velocity test. They, they see how fast the nerve travels and where does it get injured or, or pinched, they can figure that out. So that's a really cool muscle, that pronator tears. Really important muscle. I think I talked about it in the, in the workstation evaluation a little bit. All right, and then the next ones go further down. Those, those, those they now go all the way down to the wrist, all the legs to the wrist. And we got one that is on the, goes to the wrist on the thumb side, and we got one that goes to the wrist on the pinky side. This is a better picture for that. And you see here, one, one goes down here to the thumb side, and the other one goes down to the pinky side, and they are known as flexor carpi. They flex the carpi, that makes sense. One is radialis, the radius runs on the thumb side, and one is gonna be ulnaris, and the ulna is on the pinky side. So that's how you remember those kind of things. It's in the name, it's all in the name. If I look at the model, we have that pronator teres going across, and then we got one that goes all the way down to the thumb. And that would be the flex carpi radialis. And then on the others, we jump over one, and on the other side, we have one that goes all the way down to the pinky. That would be the flex carpi ulnaris, the pinky. And so now, what we need is one more, and that's in the middle, right here. And see, this one goes across over on the model. You can see that the tendon goes over that little white thing. That's that flexor retinaculum. And that one is known as the palmaris longus. You see, you can see here easier too. That's the flexor retinaculum, and there's one tendon that goes up top of it, over it, and that's the palmaris longus one. If you look at, if you do this with your hand, if you do this, you can see it here, it's sticking out. That's the palmaris longus tendon. Some people don't have, 10% don't have that muscle. So it's not the most important muscle to have, or not have, but it sort of does this general pulling on the palmar fascia. And then we got other muscles. Look, we got we got more. We got flexor pollicis. Pollux, whenever you see something with the pollux, pollux is the thumb. We're going to have some muscles underneath these four that we talked about that move the thumb and also the fingers. Somewhere we probably, yeah, I see digitorum. Digit means, digitorum means finger. So we don't study those in this session. So when you see, I'm not going to tag in here. That would be a muscle that we didn't study. It's either one on the outside by the pinky, the one in the middle going down to the palm, the palmaris longus, the one with the flexor carpi radialis going to the thumb, and then the pronator teres going right across. In Cairo school, they, they showed us this way of memorizing that. But you can take the web of the thumb here and put it right, right in your medial epicondyle and sit on that thing and have all your fingers go down the forearm. And so the fingers are your outline for all the muscles. Pornated teres, flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, and flexor carpi um, And then all we got left is the back side of the arm. And in the back side, we don't need as much strength, because we have mostly we do this and hold things this way. Not, we're not walking around with the rotary backs holding them that way. That would be kind of weird. And so we have less muscle mass in the back side. You can also see that here versus here. Anyway, on the back side, we got a couple. They are attached to the lateral epicondyle, that's the outside here. And, and we have, like in the front, we have now one going to the carpals on the wrong thumb side, one going to the carpals on the pinky side, and then one going on top. So that's the three we're going to do. So we're going to do the extensor carpi radialis. So that goes to the thumb side. So see, there's a lot going on here. You, you, there is even a lot in the brevis. We don't worry about that. Just do what the, the one thing, okay? So that goes to the thumb side, and then we got the one here on the inside. That goes to the, oh shoot, where was that? Extensive carpio, that is here. That goes to the pinky side here. That's the extensive carpio. So on the model, it gets, it's goofy. And you see, you got all these different muscles here. So that's why I'm only doing three. So I'm gonna do the one on the outside. If the tag is on the outside to the thumb, it's the extensive carpi radialis. 
And then if the tag is on the inside by the pinkest extensor, Carpi omnibus. And then we got the last one, and that's known as the extensor digitorum. And you can see that that's the one that goes from the um, on, on top all the way down, but you see the tendons go to the fingers. So you see here, those the tendons here, the muscles here, the tendons go into the fingers. That's the extensor digitorum. And so on the model, now we have this one, then we have this one, and then we have these out here. Those are the three. And the last, the one that on top here next to it is that was the brachioradialis. So you want to be careful to orient, orient yourself on the brachioradialis. That's right in the, between the flexors and the extensor muscles. So that's the brachioradialis. And then from there you get into the back of the head. Next to it is the extensor carpi radialis one more time, the extensor digitor, and then the extensor carpi radialis. All right. How's that? Good? Questions? You probably knew all that already, right? There you go, that's what I mean. Okay, if you're pretty good, then let's do a little um, quizzy. Where is my, I need an arm. So number one, now we're just doing the arm muscles. Tell me the muscle here on top. The one that's above the spine of the scapula. What's that muscle called, number one? Number two, I want you to tell me the muscle that's on the outside here. The shoulder pocket muscle thing. Number three, what's the big muscle in the back of the arm? Oh, number three. And then number four, it's a little trickier, and I actually didn't show it on the lecture, the muscle that's in the front here that goes from the coracoid process, which is behind in here, into the humerus. What is that little muscle called? Number five, we're going to go to the forearm muscles. And I want you to tell me a muscle that's on top here that crosses the forearm. It's the forearm. It crosses the forearm over, and it's a muscle that brings the palm down. And then we jump all the way to the outside, or the lateral, oops. And I want you to tell me the muscle that goes to the pinky side. And then number seven, we got one muscle that if you take the thumb and you go all the way up and you're almost hitting here the biceps, it's this big, it's not that, it's pretty big actually for forearm muscle. It's right in here, that long one, sort of in between the, front and the back. And then last, we got one muscle that is here on the upper side, on the outside of the arm, that goes from the uh, lateral epicondyle all the way down to the fingers. What's that one called? All right, let's solve it. What's the last one called? Extensor digitorum. Very good. Then the one here on top. Brachialis. Brachioradialis. That's a tough one. Make sure you study that a little bit. Brachioradialis. And then on the front side, on the flexor side, we have the one that goes to the pinky. Flexor corpi ulnaris. Very good. And then we have one that goes across on top that brings the palm down. Pronator teres. And then, did I do this one? Yeah. What's that one? Uh, very good, you guys. Coracobrachialis. It's very good. And then, did I do the triceps? Good, triceps. You got that, right? That's like, you know, that's easy. Thank you for all that muscle mass being the same muscle. If we had this discussion, the whole arm should be just one arm muscle, right? That would be easier to not study that. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. And then we had the shoulder pocket muscle, the outside. What was that called? The deltoid. And I think lastly, I started with this one up here. That's super. Okay. Good. Does that make you feel a little better about these muscles?